I found Alan Turing's original paper in 1936 that he wrote on this problem of, uh, of computation, on the idea of a computing machine and what it should be. And uh, it's not an easy paper to read, but I left a copy of it on your, uh, on your table there. And he was 24 years old. He was born in 1912. So he was 24 years old when he wrote that famous paper. I also printed out another paper, which in some ways is even more famous, at least with non-technical people. It's a paper he wrote that appeared in Mind Magazine. And I'm not really sure what that is, but my guess is that it's something like a, like a scientific American style. It's, it's a journal of philosophy? It's a real journal? Yeah. Not a popular thing? Okay, so, so it's a philosophy uh, um, journal, and he wrote a paper that's very readable and that's been reprinted in a lot of places, and I have it up front and you can look at it. It's got nothing to do with Turing machines or undecidability. It has to do with the Turing test and the beginnings of artificial intelligence. Basically, his thesis that there's no reason why a computer can't do what, what humans can do, and here's why I think that. And people have written uh, rebuttals and comments to this, for the whole last 50 years. And um, I have a lot of literature on all that stuff. It doesn't really connect much to this course, but it is kind of fascinating to read that article. So I left that up there for you, too. But what I have here that I want to read to you is some excerpts of his paper that are actually comprehensible, to give you a little sense of what he was thinking when he was 24 years old about, about these ideas. Um, so here it is. This is Alan Turing, uh, his paper on computable numbers. He says, computing is normally done by writing certain symbols on paper. We may suppose this paper is divided into squares, like a child's arithmetic book. In elementary arithmetic, the two-dimensional character of the paper is sometimes used. But such a use is always avoidable. And I think that it will be agreed that the two-dimensional character of paper is no essential of computation. I assume, then, that the computation is carried out on a one-dimensional paper, that is, a tape divided into squares. And I'll also suppose that any number of symbols which may be printed is finite. So he's using some finite alphabet. So he's describing this, this formality that we all know today very well. If we were to allow an infinity of symbols, then there would be symbols differing to an arbitrary small extent. The effect of this restriction of the number of symbols is not very serious. It's always possible to use sequences of symbols in the place of single symbols, etc. So he says how to encode things with a few number of symbols. And the next thing is kind of interesting, the next uh, paragraph, because... It's very easy to read wrong nowadays, now that we have the word computer in our vocabulary. He says, the behavior of the computer at any moment is determined by the symbols which he is observing and his state of mind at that moment. So what do you think that means? The behavior of the computer at any moment is determined by the symbols which he is observing and his state of mind at that moment. That's like the fundamental idea of a Turing machine. He's saying that the transition depends on what state you're in and what symbol you're looking on at the tape. But read the grammar. Isn't it strange? I mean, he's, it seems like he's just anthropomorph, whatever that word is, the verb, the, the computer, right? He refers to it as a he and his state of mind at that moment. So how do you think you read that line? He's talking about the person, computer. Right, he's talking about one who computes. The word was not commonly used at the time. So he's using it, he's making it up. He says, one who computes is a computer a person who computes, not a machine that computes. And he's talking about the computer as someone who computes. And, and, and he uses this for the next three or four paragraphs. So it's very interesting and easy to read wrong today. We may suppose that there is a bound B to the number of symbols or squares which the computer can observe at one moment. If he wishes to observe more, he must use successive observations. Move along on the tape where he left the other stuff. We'll also suppose that the number of states of mind which need to be taken into account is finite. Right? So whatever methods this person is using to do his computation, it's a finite state machine, really, that's doing it. The reasons for this are of the same character as those which we restrict the number of symbols. If we admitted an infinity of states of mind, some of them will be arbitrarily close and will be confused. All right. Uh, let us imagine the operations performed by the computer to be split up into simple operations which are so elementary that it is not easy to imagine them further divided. So he's trying to take all sorts of computation and divide them into their teeniest, most atomic stages. Every such operation consists of some change of the physical system consisting of the computer and his tape. We know the state of the system if we know the sequence of symbols on the tape, which of these are observed by the computer, and the state of mind of the computer. 
So there he's describing what we call a configuration of the machine. Right? Any other changes can be split up into simple changes of this kind. The situation in regard to the squares whose symbols may be altered in this way is the same as in regard to the observed squares. So without any loss of generality, assume that the squares whose symbols are changed are always the ones that we're observing. Because we can always move over and look at the ones we want to change if they're not right in front of us right now. Okay, and then he says a few more things, and he talks about the tape, and he says, the simple operations must therefore include changes of the symbol on one of the observed squares. B, changes of one of the squares observed to another square within L squares of one of the previously observed squares. A possible change of symbol together with a possible change of state of mind. A possible change of observed squares together with a possible change of state of mind. Now, the most interesting part of this paper, and we're going to talk about it a little bit today, is that what he does after he describes the notion of computation and how it should be done, he describes that he can actually build a particular program that simulates other programs. So he's going to write a Turing machine that takes other Turing machines as its input and then executes them, simulates them, runs them. That's just like what your computers do. You write a program and it does your program. So the machine becomes your virtual machine. If you're in Scheme, the machine is understanding Scheme, even though it could understand anything else because you told it how to understand Scheme. So underlying all these programs that you run is a universal program that can do anything. And that's the computer. And that's what he's describing. He says he can make a Turing machine that reads other Turing machines in his input and simulates them. And that's what we call today the universal Turing machine. He says, now we may construct a machine to do the work of this computer. And he goes in a lot of detail describing the universal Turing machine. And then, uh, and then he gives up, and it's pretty much the main beginning and the main idea of the motivation of his paper. Uh, I'll leave this out there, too, because it's worth reading. I skipped a lot of it, but a lot of it's fun. And I want to get back to talking about his model. We show that having extra tapes isn't really extra power, and having non-determinism isn't really extra power, and having two-way infinity isn't extra power. There are a lot of questions that people have asked me in the last day or two that relate to these variations, and I just want to say a few more. What if you allow uh, a restricted number of tape symbols? Let's say 0, 1, and blank. Well, you can prove, there's a theorem that says, if you give me any Turing machine that uses any number of tape symbols that it wants, I can write another Turing machine that does the same thing and uses only zeros, ones, and blanks. So without any loss of generality, you can assume your machine only has these, these three symbols. However, there's usually a payoff for making these transformations. So what do you think gets bigger in the machine if you knock the symbols down from a large alphabet to a small alphabet? There's probably more states in the machine. Right? So you can't have everything. You can't say, OK, I want this machine to only have three symbols and say no more than uh, 10 states. OK, why not? Well, why? Why is that too many limitations? What if I, what if I restrict the number of tape symbols, I restrict the number of states? If I only have 10 states on the board, I make 10 circles, and I only have two symbols, you could list every single Turing machine there is. Just try every possible transition that comes out of one state to another state and put the different combinations of symbols on them and different writing symbols. You could just list all the Turing machines in the world. There'd be a finite number. That's a completely uninteresting model of computation. Even finite state machines, there's an infinite number of finite state machines. We don't say, let's restrict the finite state machines to a 10 finite states. At that point, there would just be a finite number of computations you could do. So you can't restrict both things at the same time. There's a trade-off. If you do, you completely cut off the power of the machine. You've got to be able to expand one thing unbounded amount. And we typically imagine that the finite state can get as big as you want, but stay finite. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of grad students, right, in the <laughs> 60s and 70s. 
Yeah, no, no, I mean, there, there is a model where you say, I only want three states, but you can have as many symbols as you want. And you can probably make a trade-off like that. But you can't restrict everything. All right, so I talked about a universal Turing machine. That's a Turing machine that takes other Turing machines as input and then executes them. So it doesn't have any kind of computation of its own, so to speak. It's not doing a square or a cube or, or checking for palindromes. All it does is take other descriptions of Turing machines and do them, whatever they do. So this machine can do anything. You write a program, a Turing machine program that you want to do, and you send it to this machine, and it'll go ahead and execute it. Usually you'll send it the machine along with an input. And you'll say, simulate this machine on this input. You'll send in two things. In Alan Turing's paper, you can read a description of a universal Turing machine. It's very mechanical, a little tedious. You know, it says, look over here, see what state you're in, see where it says you should write, go over here, move to the tape. It's just you're looking at a description of a program, and, it, and this universal Turing machine simulates that description. Just for some interest, you can write a universal Turing machine with seven symbols on your alphabet, five states, and one tape. You do that for homework. I don't know what it looks like. But you can, there, is, there are universal Turing machines that have just this simple structure. Now, yeah, Neil, you have a question? <coughs> I don't know if it's the smallest. I don't think there is any, quote, smallest, because to make a universal Turing machine, we have to say how we're going to encode Turing machines. There's a lot of different ways to encode Turing machines. You could, you could you know, just turn them into characters and then turn those into binary by ASCII. You could, you could count the number of states and put that in binary and then put the transitions like we did for finite state machines into sequences of zeros. There's lots of ways to encode a Turing machine. And depending on how you encode it, this universal Turing machine is going to be very different. So you have to decide what Turing machines look like in binary, and then this universal Turing machine can be explicitly constructed. So to say what the smallest one is depends very much on how you decided you were going to encode your Turing machines. And depending on how you encode it, this could be bigger or smaller. But this is certainly, the idea is to show you that it doesn't have to be some huge crazy machine, and you can really do it. Most people don't do it, but you can find it somewhere, and you can do it yourself. There are books by Roger Penrose called the, I think called The Emperor's New Mind, um, and some sequel to that book, which is a, uh, uh, he takes Alan Turing to task for the idea of artificial intelligence, and he says, I don't really think machines are ever going to be like humans, and here's why. And in that book, he does a review of computational complexity, quantum mechanics, neurobiology, and puts it all together and makes his, uh, makes his point. In that book, there's an actual universal Turing machine that he writes, or he describes, in pretty much detail. So that's another place you can go find one. And it's a worthwhile book. It's, uh, it's interesting reading. What, what does this machine take again? It takes another Turing machine. It takes another Turing machine and an input, and it executes that other Turing machine on that input. On that input. Right. It gives the output. Exactly. It just does what that other Turing machine would do. And, and really, it's this existence of a universal Turing machine that Alan Turing used to justify the generality of his model of computation. If this is really a general model of computation, I should be able to write some program on it that reads all the other programs. For example, let's say he picked a finite state machine as his model of computation. There is no universal finite state machine that reads other finite state machines and simulates them. Far from it. There's not even finite state machines that easily recognize strings that are other finite state machines. Finite state machines are idiots compared to this model. I mean, this model is really very, very self-aware and, and a completely general model of computation, so much so that you can write a program that reads other programs and simulates them. And it's this, this idea of a universal Turing machine, which is going to be at the heart of all the decidability things that we're going to talk about pretty soon. E.G., you got a question? Other questions? Neil, questions? It seems surprising there's so many different languages. Because, you know, you can do it all in one. Yeah, well, well, think of all the different assignments you had this year in programming. And all the two million programmers who write programs every single day. 
right? And they don't have to go ahead and build a new machine every time they have a program. All they do is type their program in, and the same Pentium 3 does it. And that's exactly the same idea here. It's exactly the same idea. The, the machine language behind you know, your Pentium 3 is this universal Turing machine. The fact that everything that can be converted and simulated by some machine at the underlying bottom level, that's what this is saying here. But yeah, I mean, it is a little surprising. And when you first try to do it, it seems a little bit uncomfortable. But you can really just do it. I should say, though, that when you send a Turing machine into a universal Turing machine, it can simulate it just fine. But it can hardly do anything as far as answering interesting questions about the Turing machine that you sent in. If I send in a Turing machine to a universal Turing machine, it'll simulate it. I can write a program that takes Turing machines and tells you how many states they have. It just counts the states you know, in the description. I can write a Turing machine that looks at other Turing machines and tells you uh, how many symbols are in the alphabet. But I can't write a Turing machine that does anything more clever than just simulate. I can't write a Turing machine that takes other Turing machines and says, oh, this Turing machine definitely accepts you know, the set 0 star 1 among the many things it accepts. Things like that are hard to do. Basically, the most you can do is simulate. You can't do anything more clever in general. Programs are so general that if you try to make a finite collection of reasons why something interesting about them is true or not true, you will fail. There's basically an infinite number of different things that, that make Turing machines act one way or the other. So simple questions like, will they go into an infinite loop? There's no way to do. And we'll talk about that very soon. Other questions? Sure. Sure. A universal Turing machine, remember, what's it expecting? It's expecting an input, which is a Turing machine and some string, right? So you could give this another universal Turing machine along with the input to that, which would be some other Turing machine and a string. And this universal Turing machine would simulate the universal Turing machine simulating that thing. Sure. Like an emulator. More like an emulator. But compiler, not so far off either. Right? It's a lot like an emulator. It's just like, here's a machine that's running your program, and here's another machine that can run any program, but that machine is going to run it by simulating your machine simulating the program. Sure, you can do that. So is this a connection then between the Turing machines and the lambda calculus? The idea that you can sort of take, take an operation and put it into Sure, right. You, you should definitely get that intuition. The lambda calculus is just as general a method of computation as Turing machines. You might wonder why you know, Church's lambda calculus didn't end up being the basis of computational complexity. Why did this end up being the basis? And it's because scientists like this better. It's easier to prove things with this, and the lambda calculus is just... I mean, it's kind of fun and it's neat, but it's just hairy and terrible to prove things with. It looks like scheme. It looks just like scheme. Um, I think you had an exercise that was up on the, uh, the pad trying to use the lambda calculus to generate integers. So you'd use procedures to represent integers. And then procedures calling other procedures that would give you a successor function and give you subsequent integers. And just to do something simple, like defining integers and then defining addition was, I don't know, something long, some some 200 line scheme program. Not that this is much more elegant, but, but it's just more, you know what it's like? It's like the difference between thinking, in some ways, the difference between thinking about expressions and about machines. It's easier to think about computation through machines rather than through a grammar or through an expression. I think that's why people picked it. At least it's, well, historically, it was just a choice. Right. So Turing was. 24, when he wrote this uh, Turing machine paper. And then he wrote that AI paper in 1950, when he was uh, 38. And then he died in 1953, I think. He was 41 years old. It's amazing how young he was. And he committed suicide. He was oppressed for being a homosexual. And he was, um, there was a 
uh, a court case against them, and, and, and the judgment was either you go to jail or you take forced hormone injections. And he was just humiliated and disgusted by his own country, who he thought, you know, during World War II, he was a hero. He helped break the codes that helped uh, um, find German submarines. And it was, a, it was secret up until 10 years ago, even. Or even, maybe it's, some of it's still secret for all I know. You know how spies are. Um, anyway, he, he thought of himself as a hero, and so did everyone else. But meanwhile, his country kind of, you know, couldn't get over whatever issues they were having. Uh, and, uh, and he had decided that it wasn't worth living, and he killed himself with an apple laced with cyanide when he was 41 years old in 1953. Really a young man, especially on today's standards. And, uh, and that was his life. And if you go on the web, you'll see lots of sites dedicated to him. There was a book recently written all about it called... Um, Alan Turing, the Enigma, I think refers to the machine he was using to break the codes and also kind of a pun, him as a person. Uh, and there was a play on Broadway that was based on that book, and there was some, some kind of PBS special that was based on the play. Breaking the Code, Breaking the code was the name of the play? I think so. It's like a so the, uh, oh yeah, the, the PBS thing, the Master Proceeds, right. And uh, the author of this book, Andrew Hodges, has a site that's uh, dedicated to Alan Turing where you can find almost anything about his life as well as all his scholarly uh, work. Interesting, a very interesting person. All right, let's shift gears a little here. But at some point today, I want to do another Turing machine. We did one, right? You should at least do another one. We'll do one that, it's going to be a big one, not horrible. And, but I want to do interesting stuff before we do it, because doing it is just not so much fun. You just need to see one. Uh, so I'm going to do something more fun first. Languages that are recursive are sets of strings that you can write Turing machine programs to always give an answer yes or no to every string. It always guarantees to stop. Those are recursive languages. They're also called Turing decidable by our book, or by other people, just decidable. Examples of decidable sets. The set of all strings that represent uh, finite state machines that accept an infinite number of things. That's a decidable set. I can write a program that looks at a finite state machine, looks for a loop in the graph, tells me whether it accepts an infinite number of things. I can answer yes or no every single time. 0 to the n, 1 to the n, recursive set. I can look at a string and tell you whether it's in the form 0 to the n, 1 to the n. There's lots and lots of recursive sets, lots and lots of things you can write programs for that answer yes or no all the time, one way or the other. Recursively enumerable means that you can answer yes if the answer is yes, but if the answer is no, you may run forever. These are sometimes called acceptors or recognizers. These are also sometimes called undecidable. Because you can't decide yes or no, you can just decide yes. And our book calls them Turing, what does it call them? Recognizable? Acceptable. Turing acceptable. And then this Twilight Zone level, not recursively enumerable, means that if somebody gives you a description of a set, you can't even say whether the answer is yes. There are some sets that you can't say whether the answer is yes, and they're complement, you know, asking whether the answer is no, you can't say that either. There are some sets who the set itself and its complement, neither one is recursively enumerable. Okay, there are examples of that, and I'll, I'll give you one in just a second. There are plenty of sets where you can answer yes or no all the time, and there's plenty of sets where you can answer yes if the answer is yes, but when the answer is no, the complement of that problem, that is, it's not recursively enumerable. So I want to write down a few things, things that people sometimes call theorems, but they're just completely logical things that will help you understand the difference between these three levels. Then I'll give you some examples. So here's, say, theorem number one. Let's say I have a set A, and I look at its complement, A complement, and they're both recursively enumerable. So I can make a machine, a Turing machine, that looks at a particular set and tells me yes if a string is in that set, and 
If it's not, it won't necessarily stop. And if it looks at all the strings that are not in that set, and it wants to recognize those, if I give it a string and it's not in that set, it will eventually say, yes, it's not in the set. But if it is in the set, it might run forever. You might not get an answer. So let's assume that both of these are recursively enumerable. If that's the case, then A is recursive. Then you can answer yes or no on anything in A. And it's kind of obvious, but let's be very specific about how we do it. To show that something's recursive, you have to describe to me a Turing machine program that answers yes or no correctly. You have a machine that will answer yes if the string is in A. You've got a machine that will answer yes if the string is not in A. Both those machines could run forever if the answer was not the one they were looking for. If the answer was no here, it could run forever. If the answer was yes, it is an A here, the machine could run forever. How do you combine these two machines, neither one of which is guaranteed to halt, to get a machine that is guaranteed to halt to always tell you yes or no? Everyone understand this question? You have two machines, neither one is guaranteed to halt. They're both guaranteed just to recognize their sets. How do you write a machine that's guaranteed to halt and say yes or no? Who's got an idea? Think of it as a high level description. Tell me how to write a program. You've got two programs, one for this, one for this, that recognize. They both might run in infinite loops. Describe to me another program that will never go in an infinite loop. Runs both of them in parallel. What does that mean, runs both of them in parallel? We, <coughs> well, what does that mean? You could do it, it computes on A for a while, and then it computes on not A for a while, back and forth. Okay, so somebody gives me a string, some X, and Chris is suggesting that we run X on A for a while. Not for too long, because if we're running on A for too long, and if it's not an A, it's going to run forever. So we're going to run it on A for a little while, and if the answer is yes, and it says yes, we'll stop, and we'll say yes. And if it doesn't say anything, what do we do? We'll put it down for a minute, and we'll take the string, and we'll move it over to the machine that checks for A complement, we'll run it on this one for a while. And if this stops and says yes, then we'll stop and say, no, it's not in A. And if this never stops, then we go back to this one. So actually, we should be very specific. Why don't we just run it one step on each machine and then go back and forth? Boom, 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 boom. What happens then is sooner or later, one of these is going to say yes. Because they're guaranteed to say yes if the answer is actually yes. And X is either an A or an A complement. So one of these machines is going to stop and say yes. And whichever one does, then we stop and give the appropriate answer. If this one says yes, then we stop and say yes. And if this one says yes, we stop and say no, it's not an A. Okay, this simulation is actually an idea that will come up again and again. The idea of combining two machines, neither one of which is guaranteed to halt, with a machine that kind of dovetails between them and gets all the possible computations together, one of which is guaranteed to stop. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to write this out. X is simulated one step at a time on each machine, the one for A and the one for A complement. Sooner or later, one of these is going to stop and say yes because the string is either in this one or in this one, and whichever one stops and says yes, I stop. So this program, the combination of the two, is guaranteed to stop and say yes or no. This is an important theorem you should know, and it's very intuitive. It means that if you have a problem that's undecidable, its complement has got to be not recursively enumerable. You can't have its complement be recursively enumerable if it's recursively enumerable. Because if they were both recursively enumerable, the complement and the one, it would both end up being recursive. So the complement of a recursively enumerable set is not recursively enumerable. You can't do a thing with it. Let me give you some real examples of this. All right, so examples of recursive sets. All strings that look like that, that's a recursive set. Uh, 
all finite state machines that accept everything. That's a harder recursive set. It takes a little longer to do, but it's completely decidable. You can read a finite state machine, minimize it, see if it equals the single state machine that accepts everything, answer yes or no appropriate. Those are recursive sets. What's an example of a recursively enumerable set? CFGs that do not accept sigma star. That's a recursively enumerable set. How do I write a recognizer for context-free grammars that don't accept everything, that don't generate everything? I'll write CFLs so I don't have to say generate. CFLs that don't accept everything. How do you do that? What's the brute force thing to try? Try every single string. Try every single string. Try strings from the empty string and then the next biggest string and the next biggest string. List the strings in lexicographic order and size order and try them all to see if the CFL accepts them. Is there a way to check whether a CFL accepts a certain string? That's the membership algorithm. That's what compilers do. That's the CYK algorithm. It's Early's algorithm. There's lots of different algorithms to do it. That's what compilers do. We can always decide, given a string in a CFL, yes or no, does the CFL accept it? So we'll do EJ's idea and we'll generate the strings in size order. We'll run each one through our membership checker. And if they keep accepting, we just keep going. If the CFL doesn't accept everything, sooner or later we'll get to the string that it doesn't accept. And at that point, the answer will say no. And we'll stop and say, yes, this CFL does not accept everything. So EJ's idea is fine. We can just go ahead and list them in order and check membership for each one. Can you call something recursively enumerable regardless of which one eventually returns, whether it's the yes, the true, or the false? Or do you have to like take the complement of it? It's the second thing you said, and it's a little bit of a technicality. But, but recursively enumerable, we're always talking about the yes answer being important. It's an arbitrary focus, but the yes answer is what determines the set. So this is the set of all CFLs that don't accept everything. There is a way to recognize these, to say yes when the answer is yes. But let's do just what you ask. What about the complement of this? That is the CFLs that generate everything. Can you write something to recognize these? Something that will eventually say yes. If you could, we would have two sets, one of which is the complement of the other, both of which were recursively enumerable. If we could do this, then this would be a recursive set. This would be something we can answer. And you should remember from what I showed you a couple days ago in reductions that this is an undecidable problem. I mean, it can't be done recursively. So the opposite of this, there's no way to do. This is something which is not recursively enumerable. You can't even answer yes when the answer is yes. I give you a context-free language. You can chug along all you want, and you will never, ever be able to tell me yes for sure if it accepts everything. The best you can do is try every single string one at a time. And after you've tried the first two trillion strings and they're all accepted, then you're just as close to the infinite number you have to check as you were when you started. Right? And you can leave a legacy to your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. They can keep doing it. And 2,000 years down the line, you're still just as close to the infinity that you have to check as you started. You're really getting nowhere. And there's no better way to do it. That's what this proof of this really would mean. That there's no way to do it. Not just because we can't think of a way, but there's really no way. So there's an example of a set which is undecidable and its complement which is not even partially decidable, which is not recursively enumerable. Turing machines that halt on a specific input. In other words, I give you a Turing machine, I give you a particular input, I want to know, does this Turing machine 
eventually stop on this input or does it go into an infinite loop? I give you two inputs, Turing machine and, an in, and, a, and a string. Does the Turing machine stop, yes or no? I want to know the status of A and A factorial. Not decidable. I mean, I mean recursively enumerable? So A is recursively enumerable. Why, Joe? Why can you? No, no, not recursively. Not recursively enumerable? You think it is? Well, what do you think? We got a vote here. If you think it is, give me a way you would do it. How would you recognize strings that represent Turing machines and inputs where the Turing machine stops on that input? What would you do? Right. Use your universal Turing machine to start it up. Then what? Let it go. If it actually ends up stopping, you stop and say, yes. And then, if you do that, you'd know for sure that the Turing machine halted on a particular input. But what if it runs forever? You can't say it might not stop, but you can say if it does stop. So this, we say, is recursively enumerable. And what about its complement? Things that don't halt on a, on a specific input, things that definitely go into an infinite loop, that we have no way to check, and that's not recursively enumerable. Keep in mind, I haven't proved any of these are true. I'm just working in with intuition. I want you to be able to guess the right thing. All right, let's do another example. A equals Turing machines that halt on every input you might ever give them. Okay, so now I just give you a Turing machine and I want to know, is this safe on all the inputs? Will this always stop? Always say yes or no. This is another way to ask, I'm giving you a Turing machine. Does it re represent a recursive language? It's another way to ask this question. But, you know, does it stop on every input? What do you think? Can you recognize things like this? Well, but you'd have to give it every input to know that it halts on every input. On a particular input, you can just wait until it sooner or later stops. If it stops, you're guaranteed to know that. But if you want to check that it halts on every input, how would you ever know that? Even if you let it run forever, you wouldn't know that. Uh, Chris, you had a question? Yeah. So what do you think? This is... Is it recursively enumerable or not recursively enumerable? Yeah? What do you think, Tony? If, if, it, if the statement is that it halts on every input, either yeah. it halts on the first input or it doesn't. Oh, oh, okay. yeah. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could do this kind of trick. I, 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 could, I could take all the inputs, like, like, like EJ said, in, uh, in size order. And I'll run the, f the, the first string for one step. And then I'll start the next string going, and I'll run that for one step, and then I'll run the first string for a second step. And then the next time, I'll start the third string going, and I'll run the second string for one more step, and I'll run the first string for a third step. Everybody see what I'm doing? I'm starting all the inputs, at the, so they're all running at the same time. A huge time-sharing system. By the time I'm on the 50th string, the first string has done 50 steps, the second string has done 49 steps. So this way, I'm running them all at the same time. Even if I do that, is there any way to check that it's going to stop on all of them? I can run it and run it and run it, and all the ones that I started can start to stop. They can all start halting, but I still won't know if it's going to halt on all of them until I go forever. So as far as we can tell, this is not recursively enumerable. And what about its complement? You're thinking about the complement. Let's think about the complement. Turing machines that don't halt on every input. That means, the complement of this means that there's one input that it for sure doesn't halt on. Right? How do you find if there's one input that for sure it infinite loops on? You try all the strings and you wait till you get to the one that infinite loops. 
It doesn't work. So this is an example, and it's the first example, of a set that is just completely beyond our grasp in every way. The set itself and its complement are not recursively enumerable. We cannot recognize either the set or its complement. I'm showing you this example because I don't want you to think that everything is, you can recognize one side, but it's the other side that's hard. There are some problems where both sides are just death, and you can't do anything. And it's usually when you kind of have infinite going in two directions, and that it's kind of a vague idea, but it, that is kind of what's going on. I think we should do a couple more examples, because I, I want your intuition to be good like this before I tell you the theorem, and before I actually prove anything neat. So you, yeah. The, the, the thing where if you have a recursively enumerable language, then you, you know that it, and you, for that to be a real recursively enumerable language, you know that its complement can also be recursively It cannot be recursively, right. Do, does it sometimes work out where you think you found a recursively enumerable language, and then you check its complement, and you find out? Like is it is it set also I think a useful method to find enumerable length, to find recursive languages? It's very rare that you didn't notice that something was recursive and then you finally noticed because you checked its you right. That's Okay, that's what I was Yeah, I don't no, that's not commonly used. It's more just you should realize this is not so much a theorem that I told you before as it is make sure you understand the implications of these definitions. It, it's pretty straightforward that that two sides of recursively enumerable implies recursive. But nobody uses it, I think, as a tool to find recursive algorithm. Now how about this? Uh, A equals Turing machines that accept only one string. Everyone understand? Some Turing machines accept only one string. Some finite state machines accept only one string. Some Turing machines accept only one thing and reject everything else, or infinite loop on everything else. But there's only one string that it's going to accept. So I want to know about A, and I want to know about A complement. What do you think? If you try strings here, what happens? Say, say, let's do possibility. If, like so what you want to think about A complement. Right, so if, if it's A complement, the things that, that don't accept only one string, what would you do? You'd start to run it, right? Mm -hmm. And say you accepted the 93rd string, and then you keep running it, and then you're up to uh, the 180th string, and it accepts that too. Then you say, hey, well, it just accepted two strings. It doesn't accept one string. Mm -hmm. Right? You think that's a good algorithm? So this is recursively enumerable. Yeah, what about if it doesn't accept any string? What about if I go ahead and simulate, and I do my trick. I do my dovetailing parallel trick. I mean, I got everything running at the same time. I got the first string running. It's been running for 2,000 steps. The second string has been running for 1,999 steps, etc. I'm up to the 2,000th string, and I keep expanding more strings into my alphabet and, and, and into my uh, machine, and I keep working on them. And I've done this for, say, the first 2 trillion strings, and none of them have gotten accepted. And I run this for another two million years, and none of them have gotten accepted. So can I answer that question yet? I still don't know. OK, so, it, so Chris, you would be OK in getting a recognizer here if the only way to recognize a complement was if the machine recognized two or more strings. Because I will find out if the string recognizes two or more. That I'll eventually find out. But if the string recognizes none, I'll never find that out. So this, this idea doesn't quite work, and this is not recursively enumerable. What about this? Except only one string. You can simulate it through, and what if it doesn't accept anything? You'll never know. So this is also not recursively enumerable. It's another example. And this is such an easy one. Geez, you figure you could look at a machine and decide whether it accepts just one thing or not. But you can't even recognize either end of that set. OK, one more. Last one. Turing machines that accept nothing.
term machines that accept nothing. I give you a term machine, I want to know if any inputs I throw on here, it always just goes into an infinite loop or says no. Never ever stops and says yes. What do you think? You think this is recursively enumerable? You mean Turing machines that accept something? How would I check a Turing machine that accepts something? Start feeding it strings. Start feeding it strings. Of course, we have to be careful. I can't just feed it strings in order and spend too long on any string. If I wait to see if it accepts the empty string until it either does or doesn't, I may wait forever. So I have to do my trick. This dovetailing trick is what I always call it. I don't know why I call it that, because I think of it like kind of this. Whatever you want to call it, the idea is you have to be able to simulate executing all the strings in parallel, adding new strings as you go. So the typical way it's done is if you're up to your 10,000th step, then you will execute the first string 10,000 times, the next string 9,999 times you have done that, and then your newest string that you're including in your list gets executed once. So if you do all those things in parallel, then sooner or later you will actually execute the string that gets accepted, if there is one, enough steps for it to get accepted. And if you do, you'll know that the machine doesn't accept the empty set. So this is recursively enumerable, but I'll write in parentheses here, it uses this dovetailing idea, and you should get used to that dovetailing idea, because it's a very, very common. The idea of starting the machine on one string for one step, the next step, have it go one more stage on that string, and add in the new string and start one step on that new string. After that, add the third string in. One step on the third string, an extra step on all the previous strings. Then add the fourth string in. Execute them all at the same time, adding one step in extra for each string that's already there. Yeah, Joe? It doesn't accept anything. Then it goes on forever. Right. That's why it's only recursively enumerable and not recursive. And that's just why, just what you said, is why this is not recursively enumerable. If you're trying to check that it actually accepts nothing, you'll never find out. You can run it forever and still not know. Maybe just after you wrote this down, three seconds later the machine stops and says, I accept, and you would have been wrong. So you can't know that it accepts nothing, but you can accept that it accepts something. So here's an example, another one where there's a flip. Recursively enumerable, not recursively enumerable. Here are two examples where they're both not recursively enumerable. There's a whole set of theorems about how to decide whether something's recursively enumerable or not recursively enumerable. And here's a version of one of them, which is very, very easy to, to state and not too bad to prove. And we won't prove it today. We'll get to it at some point. But here's what it basically says. If you have a language like this that consists of Turing machines and you want to accept all the Turing machines that something, some property, you know, that halt on every input, that accept only one string, that accept nothing. If there are at least, well, if this property is not trivial, then at least one of these is going to be not recursively enumerable. That's what the theorem says. What does trivial mean? It means if the property is true for all Turing machines, that's trivial. But if there's at least one Turing machine that it's true for and one that it isn't, that's not trivial and it's impossible to write an algorithm for it. So what's an example of a trivial property? Turing machines that, uh, that have at least one state in them. Right? That's trivial. Turing machines that generate a recursively enumerable set. Well, they all do. Program by definition generates sets that you can recognize. Anything that's trivial is, is simple to decide. But anything that you can have one Turing machine that does it, like halts on every input, there's some that do that, there are some that don't, anything like that, any non-trivial property of the Turing machines makes the language, at least one half of it, not recursively enumerable. The distinction to know whether its complement is recursively enumerable or not, that's a harder theorem, and we'll get to it later. Okay, questions about this stuff? I don't exactly understand uh, dovetailing. I understand that if you have a, if it accepts something that is a finite length, that you can find it in a finite amount of time. But what is dovetailing again? All right, so what you said is the main idea of it. Let me explain it again, because probably not everybody gets it either. Here's the idea of dovetailing, and the way we'll describe it is in the solution to this A complement. 
we want to come up with a method to determine whether to determine whether a Turing machine accepts something. So we make all the strings in order, in size, etc. And we start running the Turing machine on these strings. Now here's a way that doesn't work. It's not okay to run the Turing machine on this string and wait to see what the answer is. Because you might not ever get an answer. We're trying to find out whether the Turing machine stops and accepts one of these strings. You can't just run it on this string, say wait for the answer, yes or no, and then go on to the next string. So we have to kind of dovetail through. Let's run this for one step, and then move on to this guy. And then let's run this for one more step, and run this for one step. Okay, and now let's have the machine start on this one, run this for one step, run this for one more, and run this for one more. And now we'll have the machine start in the fourth string. Run this for one step, run this for another step, run this for another step, and run this for another step. It's keeping track of four different computations. It's got an infinite tape. It can keep track of these computations as much as it wants. At any given time, it's running an arbitrary number of computations, all at different points in the tape, doing one more step on each one every single time it moves on. So it's a lot of work. It's got to go to this area, move one more step, this area, move one more step. And that way, it hits every single string's computation as far as you want in a finite amount of time. So if it's the tenth string that gets accepted on the 70th spot, I can calculate exactly how many steps it'll take my machine to find that. Okay? It'll have to go down 70 strings below and finally get that string over here done 70 steps worth. Does that make sense, Tony? Yeah. I get it about 90%. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? Maybe there's more clarification I can do on this? One thing I'm not sure I get is you still can only, a given cycle can only be on one string at a time, right? They're not really running in parallel. So it just, it either goes yes. on the list. Yes, the machine is always focusing on one string at a time. So if you've gone 10,000 times, your first one wouldn't have actually gotten 10,000 cycles on it, would it? If you've done 10,000, if you started 10,000 strings, Let's say we're up to the 10,000th string. We, every oh, 10,000 strings, I'm sorry, yeah, it just it would be more than 10,000 cycles. I, I, I was confusing two things. Every, time, every string you add represents another cycle on each of them. Every string you add represents doing one more cycle or one more step of the computation on each one of the ones above you. This trick is useful if you want to prove that you're going to halt on one or more even though on some of those you may never halt. It's a way of getting the ones, in which you halt. the ones in which you halt, even though there may be others that you don't halt. So you don't get stuck on the infinite row. You know what it's exactly like, if you remember, and this might not be useful for any of you, but um, I'll tell you anyway. Yeah. At some point, somebody proved to you that rational numbers had the same cardinality as integers. And they represented rational numbers by pairs of numbers, you know, A over B. And that every entry in this big table, in this big infinite table, is a rational number. And to show you that it's the same cardinality as the integers, I have to show you a way of getting through it in an organized, listable way. And here's the wrong way to do that. OK, just number them this way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then what's this number? Well, I went infinity, so I can't continue. But that's just the bad way to do it. The right way to do this is what? Zigzag, zigzag right. So I'm going to call this the serpentine method. No more dovetailing. Serpentine, 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 serpentine. You zigzag your way through it, keeping, in some sense, the size or the sum of the two pairs constant. These are all the ones with sum 1. These are all the ones with sum three, all the ones with sum four, all the ones with sum five, where the sum of the pairs equals five. So you start, you know, one over one, and then one over two, and then two over one, sums of two, sums of three, sums of four, sums of five. And that way I'm ordering them in a nice order. It's kind of what's going on here a little bit in the computation. It's a similar idea. If this helps, fine. And if it doesn't help, forget it. I mean, it reminds me of this.
And I think it remind most people of this, yeah. Um, could you explain again why the dovetailing doesn't work in the case that we're looking at Turing machines that accept only one string? Yes. So let's say we do this dovetailing and we're trying to recognize Turing machines that accept just one string. We don't know which one, but they're going to accept one. So we're running it on all these strings simultaneously. And we're trying to find Turing machines that accept one string. Well, let's say you go through here and one of these computations stops and says, I accept. Do you know that your Turing machine accepts only one string? Yeah. At least one string. You don't know it accepts only one string. Okay. We'd have to keep going right. forever and hope we get no other. And we can't do that. Okay. But even the opposite, even trying to get a machine that doesn't accept one string, we get trouble. Because what if we run it on all these things simultaneously and none of them ever get accepted? We just don't know if we haven't hit the string yet. Right, we don't know if we haven't hit the string yet. If I changed it, Turing machines that accept at least one, at least one string or at most one string, then I could recognize half of that. Okay. Because I could run this until sooner or later I get something more than one string. And if, and if that was going to happen, I would get it. It's saying exactly one that actually makes the two ends hard. Does that make sense, Sharon? OK. Uh, OK, so here's my plan. I'm going to do two more things today. Uh, the most interesting, exciting thing I'm going to do on Sunday. We're going to have a lecture on Sunday. Sunday, I'm going to do this decidability thing from scratch. I'm going to prove to you the first undecidable problem is really undecidable. And from there come all the reductions to these other problems that we've already talked about a little bit, where we don't have to do the proof from scratch. But that first proof, I want you guys fresh and not cloudy and, and thinking clearly. So we'll do that Sunday. Uh, what I want to finish with today is one more idea of uh, thinking about a Turing machine, and then one big example that we'll do together. So we'll finish off with some, uh, some help on this big example, and before that, a little bit of an abstraction. And the abstraction is Turing machines as enumerators. The whole course so far, we think of machines as acceptors. They either accept the strings you give them, or they reject them. For Turing machines, they might loop forever. But a Turing machine is kind of a powerful tool, and you could think of it as an outputter, just like finite state machines and context for grammars can have output. You could think of them as having output also. We usually don't talk about it in this class, but you could do that. There's a third way to think of Turing machines, and that's this way, as an enumerator. And all this means, it's not a fancy, really complicated idea, all it means is that you write a Turing machine and all it's going to do is kind of act like a grammar. It's going to generate the strings successively on its tape, all the strings that it would normally accept. Instead of waiting for input, it's got no input. You just write the program and it generates the strings out on the tape. Everyone understand what this machine does? So a different kind of Turing machine program. It's like you're writing programs and you got no input statements. I just tell you what I want you to compute, and you spit them out one at a time. And sooner or later, if I waited long enough, I'd see them all. All right, questions about that? Would it do it by just counting up lexicographically and printing out the exact? Well, that's a very good question. And if you watch the board this afternoon, I will answer it. <laughs> it's a very good question. What we're going to do right now is relate Turing machine enumerators to, uh, to Turing machine acceptors. What's the relationship between them? All right, so if a language is recursively enumerable, then there is a Turing machine enumerator. And if there's an enumerator, then the language is recursively enumerable. Hence the word enumerate. Now we're going to prove this in just a very logical way, not too tedious mathematically at all, just completely by thinking about the meanings of these different kinds of machines. Again, let's review what an enumerator is. It's a Turing machine that doesn't take any input and spits out one by one by one on its tape with, say, a special pound sign in between each string all the strings that it's supposed to uh, represent. Recursively enumerable set is a regular normal Turing machine program 
which takes in inputs and will recognize if that input is part of its set. It will say yes if the answer is yes, but might not say no. So this is a regular Turing machine recognizer, and this is an enumerator. And Chris was getting to this. If you have one, you can have the other. And let's talk about why that's true. So which would you like to do? There's two directions. Either somebody gives us a regular recognizer, and we have to come up with the enumerator, or somebody gives us the enumerator, and we have to describe the recognizer. One of them is easier than the other, I think. I don't know which is easier, but you can decide. One of them is what Chris was talking about. Chris, can you figure out which one? Someone gives you a recognizer. Somebody gives you a recognizer, a machine that takes an input and says yes if the answer is yes. And you have to come up with a Turing machine that does the enumerating. Everyone understand that problem? Again, you have a Turing machine that will recognize a string if it's in your set. You have to come up with another Turing machine that will eventually print out all the strings that that first Turing machine recognizes one at a time on the tape. Okay? Is that easy or hard to do? Let's see how that, what that sounds like. That's a good start. Let's start from there. Why don't we start with every single string? We'll start with the empty string. And we'll run it through our recognizer. And if it says yes, we'll print it out on the enumerator. The enumerator will just simulate the acceptor. And if it says yes on the empty string, we'll print it out. And if it says no, we won't print it out. It could run forever, right. Right, so we could do that dovetailing trick again. What the enumerator has to do is simulate the acceptor, but it's got to dovetail the acceptor. It's got to go ahead and run the acceptor on the first string for one step, and then on the first string for one more step, and on the second string for one step. And then on the first two strings for one more step, and on the third string for one step. And any time any of those strings stop and say, I accept you, the enumerator stops and spits it out on the tape. Does everybody get that? So the issue is that it could loop forever? It could loop forever. The recognizer does not necessarily stop. So in order to prevent that looping, we dovetail it through all the inputs at the same time. And whenever any input of the acceptor gets accepted, we print it out on the tape. So I'm going to write the proof is by dovetailing and then printing. Printing. when it gets accepted. What order are these strings going to get printed out? Any special order? Order of, completion. order of completion. Do we have any idea which string is going to get accepted first? It has to do with how many steps it takes to accept it. It's possible that the 400,000th string gets accepted in two steps, and that the first string gets accepted in two trillion steps. There is no expected order to the enumeration here. That's very important. They could come up in any order, any size. You could have very long strings getting printed out first and very short strings getting printed out later. EJ, you get that? Chris? This was the harder side, Chris Walker. Let's do the easier side. Somebody gives you an enumerator. It spits out strings one at a time with a pound sign in between each one. How do you come up with an accepting, a recognizing machine? You give the recognizing machine a string. It's got to decide whether it accepts that string. Give a yes when the answer is yes. Run down the tape comparing. Yeah, start the enumerator. Let it go. Every time it spits out a string, compare it to the string you were given as input. If they match, you say yes. And if they don't match, let the enumerator go. The enumerator is eventually going to enumerate all these strings, all the strings in the language. If your string that you're looking at is really in the language, sooner or later it's going to show up on that tape. And you'll match it. And you'll say yes. If it never gets shown up there, you'll run forever. But all we want is a recognizable Turing machine, not a decidable Turing machine. So this is just simulate the enumerator 
and compare its strings to the input. So this is, a, this is an easier direction. This is more natural. This is harder. This, this is where you really need dovetailing. This is a classic example where, where that dovetailing idea is used. So this is a theorem relating enumerators to recursively enumerable sets. They're the same. And I want you to guess a theorem. Recursive sets relate to enumerators in what kind of a way? This is not an obvious theorem to guess at all, but somebody might guess it. If an enumerator exists, there's a recursively enumerable recognizing Turing machine. If there's a recursive Turing machine, there's a special kind of enumerator that exists, better than just your typical enumerator. I'll give you a hint. Remember what I asked you before about this enumerator? When it does the simulation, how it spits out its strings? What about those strings? They don't have to be in any particular order of size. If the set is recursive, I can guarantee there's an enumerator that will generate the strings out in order of size, from smallest to largest. An enumerator that's lexicographic. All that means is it enumerates the strings in order. Let's convince ourselves why this is true. This is not so complicated to work our way through, and it'll finish up this idea, and then I can go on to my Turing machine example and finish up today. Let's think about this. Say I have a recursive set. That means I got a Turing machine program that answers yes or no. Tell me how to enumerate those strings in size order. What should I do? I can use my recursive machine and start going through strings from smallest to largest. I run it on the empty string, and I sit there and tap my foot until the machine tells me yes or no. I don't have to worry here. I got a yes or no on every single string. And if it says yes, I print it out on the enumeration tape. And if it says no, I go on to the next string. I don't have that problem. I don't have the dovetailing problem. Because of that, I don't have any kind of randomness as far as the size of the string that gets printed out first. I can guarantee that if the empty string is in this language, I will print that out first. And if it's not, then 0 will come next, then 1 will come next, and 0, 1, and then 1, 0, 0, then 0, 1, etc. I can just do them in order because the recursive set gives me a yes or no answer for each one that I generate. What about the other way? What about if somebody gives you an enumerator? Then you can just wait until where the string ought to show up shows up. Then Good. The enumerator is supposed to put the strings out in size order. So let's say the recursive, alleged recursive set is supposed to be deciding this. So I'm looking at this 1011. I'm hoping to decide yes or no on it. And I got an enumerator that generates all these strings in lexicographic order. I start it out. And I watch. If this ever shows up, I say yes. And if I ever get past it, if that ever happens, I say, whoa. The answer is no, because it didn't show up where it was supposed to. So this is a very nice, these are the kind of theorems that, that people who do this stuff for a living like. It just clarifies things that seem like they're different at first and really aren't. Enumerating things that can do things in order is the same as recursive sets. Enumerating things that are not necessarily enumerating things in size order are the same as recursively enumerable sets. If something's not recursively enumerable, then there's no enumerator for it. Yeah, Chris. Uh, a recursive set that you know, the string 1100 is the last string you accept to the infinity of strings. Can you? A recursive set whose? A recursive, uh, a decidable set. Yeah. 1100 is the last, is the largest string that it accepts set. OK. Um, and you have an enumerator. You, and 1100 doesn't show up on the tape, you'll never know whether it should be in the set or not. Because your enumerator is running forever and not printing anything out. And you haven't gotten to 1100. You're saying if the enumerator happens to be finite? If it happens to be a finite set? If the, if the set is finite, yeah. If it's a finite set, the enumerator is going to stop. The machine's going to shut down. 
You can, I, can, I, can, I can convince you of that without any loss of generality. Because if it was a finite set, I could write the enumerator to stop. I mean, it's... Yeah. Can you build an enumerator without an extension? Sure, sure. I mean, I could, I could send you home, you know, as a homework problem, write an enumerator that, here's a real simple one, that uh, enumerates zero star. So it goes on the tape without any input, puts a zero down, puts a funny pound sign down, and then, you know, counts in its head that it's up to two, and then it goes zero, zero, counts in its head that it's up to, for example. It's a little harder to enumerate other things, but but you could enumerate any of these sets if you can write a machine to accept them. All right, so I think we're ready to, we're going to finish today. We've got another maybe 15 minutes or so. We're going to finish today with, with an example, an example that I need you to engage in. Otherwise, it's just going to be like just too, uh, too detailed. We're really going to get down into the, into the dirt here of Turing machines. All right, so hopefully Sunday, please, Sunday we'll have our lecture at 1. Come with your head all clear, have a nice breakfast, then relax, and then come in. Sunday is, is, is the most, uh, it's like the crucial theorem of the whole undecidability, the first undecidable problem. And I'm going to do it from scratch, reviewing the stuff we did about finite state machines, assuming you've never seen the examples all before, and, and it'll really clarify what I hope is the most important theorem in this whole um, area. But now we're going to do something exactly the opposite. We're going to get something that isn't particularly interesting, but will give you some idea about how to write Turing machine programs. Here's a language, 0 to the n, 1 to the n squared. This is not a context-free language. You can prove it's not context-free with the pumping lemma. But it is acceptable by a Turing machine. You could certainly write your own program in Scheme or whatever to accept this. You could do a counting, you can do a loop, there's a lot of ways to do it. But we have a Turing machine. So I'm going to give you my strategy for this rather than ask you for a strategy. And then you're going to help me implement this strategy. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to start with this machine. And the first thing we're going to do, just to make sure, see, well, here's what we're going to do. First thing we're going to do is mark off these zeros one by one. And every time we mark off a zero, we're going to copy all these zeros to the other side. So my idea is that I'm going to try to copy n zeros n times, so that when I'm all done, I'll have 0 to the n squared here. And then I'll run my, then I'll move it back to this point, and I'll run my 1 to the n, 0 to the n checker on it that I did yesterday. Everyone understand that? I'm going to go through these symbols one at a time. Every time I look at one of these symbols, I'm going to go back and copy them all on the other side. So I'm going to copy n symbols n times. I'm going to get n squared zeros, hypothetically, on this side. And then I'm going to check whether the number of 1's here is the same as the number of zeros there. So I'm basically going to square this number, see if it's the same as the number of 1's. OK? How else do you want to do it? Well, you have a blank, right? It's another symbol. There's a blank on the end of this. You have tons of blanks, right? You have, like, if you add a special character, you can just overwrite the 1's and make sure your zeros run out the same time you run out of 1's. Uh, I could do that. Sure. Absolutely. I could. But then I can't go use a subroutine I did the other day. I could do it. There's a lot of other ways, too, probably. And there, and there may be better ways in this strategy. But it's just one strategy and one good example of how to use Turing machines. What you're going to see here is you're going to see a double loop, a nested loop. And you're going to see that loop in the Turing machine program. I want you to realize that Turing machine programs look like your programs. You're going to have a for loop inside of a for loop. And there's going to be variables here, the variables that kind of store where we're up to and overwrite. And there's going to be a little data structure, kind of an array of symbols that we keep writing over. It's going to get kind of complicated, but, but conceptually not too bad. Just the details will be complicated. All right, so here's what it's going to look like after the first few steps. It's going to look like this. 0 to the n, 1 n squared is how it starts. Then it's going to look like this. x, 0 to the n minus 1, 1 to the n squared, 0 to the n. Okay, that x means that we've seen 1, 0, we marked it off, and we copied n zeros to the other side. What's the next big step? This is a few steps to get to there. You're going to go through the loop again. It's going to look like this. Two x's. How many zeros? Two. n minus 2 n squared 1's and 
and two n zeros. And every single time I put another x there, I'll get another n zeros on the right side. Now I know, I, sure this is going to work sooner or later. Sooner or later it's going to look like this. Sooner or later it's going to look like x to the n, 1 to the n squared, and 0 to the n squared. And at that point I'll move my head back over here, and I'll check to see if the number of 1's here is the same as the number of zeros here like I did the other day, and if it is, I'll stop and say I accept. Are there questions about that? That's our plan, that's our strategy. The details always, like in any kind of programming problem, uh, unravel some issues. So you have to know how much n is. You have to know how many zeros you have right at the very beginning. Is that right? Because for every zero you encounter, you move over, you add n zeros to the end. That's right. So you have to like count them up beforehand. Well, what we're going to do is we're actually going to scan them one at a time and move them over. And when we come back to scan them again, we'll change the first 0 to an x. That's one way. There's a lot of different ways. We're not going to keep a counter in a separate part of the tape like we would in a real program, because that takes too much effort. Not that this is lacking in any effort, as you'll see soon. It takes a lot of work to do this. Other questions about how we're doing this? All right. There's one thing that, that you'll realize very soon, and this happens a lot in writing this Turing machine. If I write in all the transitions at the beginning, you're going to wonder why they're there. So I'm going to leave some of them out and put them in only later on when you already understand why they need to be there. And the way we're going to write this is we're going to imagine we're doing the computation and run through the machine as we go. So let's get started. I'm going to need a lot of room, so I'm going to move this away, and this should be enough room to do it if I start way up here. Here's the start symbol. All right, how do I begin? All right, the first thing he's going to be doing is I have to read all these zeros and move them over to the other side, and then on the way back, I'll turn the leftmost zero into an x. Everybody got that? So you know what I'm going to do? As I move the zeros to the other side, I'm going to cover them with another symbol, with z's, because I'm going to have to go back and forth to cover them. And when they're all covered with z's, then I know I've moved all the zeros over here. Then I go all the way back, past all the z's, turn them back to zeros as I go back, and then take the first one and turn it into an x. All right? So this idea of just copying the zeros from here to here is a big job. I've got to do it one by one, marking them off one at a time with a special symbol, which I'll call a z. Too many confused faces. Let's, let's expand this out. So it's going to look like this. 0 to the n minus 1, 1 to the n squared, 0. That's what it's going to look like at the beginning. And then the next step is z, z, 0 to the n minus 2, 1n squared, 2 zeros. Little by little, we're just going to copy them at a time. Sooner or later, it's going to be all z's, 0 to the n. Then we're going to move back, turn all the z's back to zeros, and get this. Are you leaving the x's behind? We've got to leave the x's behind, but the z's we can get rid of. You don't actually walk back across the x's. You, you go to that last zero. Good. And you're happy. Good. Right. Start right. The x is kind of the index of our outer loop, and the z is the index of the inner loop. Mm -hmm. So the z gets reset all the time, and the x we have to keep. Mm -hmm. It's but like a local variable. To count up the x's from, <clears throat> because we don't want to only be copying n minus two zeros over. Right. So then you copy, you copy the x's and the zeros. Right. We are going to have to go past the x's and think of them as zero still. Good. So how do you decide? Let's, let's do it. Yeah. So let, let, let's see what happens. It's a good question, but I think we should just get started and see. Right. I don't know, as you're getting, it's like, who the hell wants to do this, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's a mess, right? And, and, after, and it's not doing anything. Zero to the n, one n squared, it's just computing the square. I want to convince you Turing machines can do everything. I mean, this is... Not that complicated, but if we go through it, I think at least you'll get more of a convincing. And I promise it's the last one I'll do, unless you beg me to do another Turing machine. And if you want Dimitri to do some more, that's fine. But we're, gonna, we're not going to do more Turing machine programs. Last one. But, but let's finish it today and get done. Can, <laughs> all right. Um, so here's what we, ha what we do. 
If we see a zero, we mark it with a Z and go to the right. Right? All right, now what? Now, skip, skip through the zeros. Skip through the zeros. Then what happens? If I see a one, go to here and then skip through the ones. Now I'm going to get a blank. Right? When I see a blank, I write the zero down. And what do I do then? Turn back. Good. So, so Heather's a little bit ahead, and let me, let me put this in since she already said this. Heather's already looking to the next iteration of the loop. When I come back next time, I'm not going to see a blank. I'm going to see what? I'm going to see zeros. Right? Because there's already a zero there. So when I come back the next time through this loop, I'm going to need this little bypass. Zero, zero, go to the right. Zero, zero, go to the right. And then you see a blank. I hope that's what you were saying. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe so. There might, there might be a more minimal way for me to write this, but... But since I know I was, <laughs> I worked all night to make it right. If I stick with what I'm doing, I know nothing will go wrong. And, and there may be better ways to do it. All right, so this is that in case there's zeros, first do those first and then go to the blank. Otherwise, go directly to the blank. And now we've put our first zero. We're over here in the configuration, right? And now we're ready to move back, back, back and do our second iteration of the loop. So what happens? Back up over zero zero left. Now skip over the ones. So if I get a one, keep going left and skip over the ones. Zero zero left. Now I'm going back through these zeros. And sooner or later, I expect to see a, a Z. Zero, zero left. And now I should see a Z, right? We Z, Z, R. And now I'm ready to do it all again. I'm facing right. I'm looking at a zero. I'm going to turn that to a Z and carry it over. And put it on the end. Go back we haven't made any X's yet. Right. But, but Doug is thinking correctly that when I finally do put an X there, I will have to run through those X's between here and here. Let me put that in if anybody... You know, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. It, it's hard enough to get the idea just now. So, or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe... Like Dimitri says, am I insulting your intelligence that this is... I, I don't think this is, this is easy. I just think it's tedious. Now we have the whole first loop. <laughs> All right, now we have the whole first loop. So I want to think of this as the inner loop. And we're going through it, 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 and we're all done going through it. N times, it looks like... like this. 0 to the n, 1n squared, 0 to the n. And now we're backing up. And for the first time here, after we're done with the ones, we don't get a zero. See that? Usually we have zeros to back through after these ones, but now we don't. Now we get a Z. Right. This is the outer loop. This is Z, zero, left. We're turning the Zs back into zeros so that we can go back and go from here and have it be the same way it looked when we started. These are getting turned back into zeros now. Z, zero, left. Turn them all back into zeros. Now we're going to come up with a problem. See it? How do you know what? Yeah, how do you keep from going off the left end and falling down a huge cliff? Right? Well, 
Oh, I should have thought of that before, huh? I'm dead. Here's what I needed to do at the very beginning. And I'm not going to put this in the machine because it's one of the exercises in your problems at five in another week or so. But at the very beginning, I needed to take this machine and turn it into this. I needed to take the string and push everything over and put a special symbol on the left end. So that at this point, instead of falling off the left end, I hit that symbol. That shifting is a very nice exercise for you to learn how to do. It's only a four state machine and it's kind of a, a little get ready to do a real computation. Because any real computation you do better have a left end marker so you don't fall off the end. So you kind of, kind of always do this. This is like initializing your string to be really ready to be used. And you can do that with a five state machine. So take my word for it, you can do that. Assume it was done, and then at this point, I'm not going to fall off the left end. Instead, what am I going to do? I'm going to hit the dollar sign. Okay? Give me one of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Smarty, you're an X. But we haven't put any X's down. So wait. Just wait on that. All right, so dollar sign, dollar sign, go to the right. That's my turnaround point. Then what? Before we go back to the top, we have to remember that we just did this inner loop once. So we've got to mark one of those zeros with an x. Zero, x, r. OK? Mark one of the zeros with an x. Then what? Got to go back to the beginning. So, 0, 0, left, x, x, left. Scoop back through all the zeros and x's until you get to the very beginning. And when you hit the dollar sign again, you're ready to go. Okay, um, wait, so, 0, x, r assumes that the first, that's going to work down the first place. Good. So, what do I need? I need a loop here that does what? Uh, x, x, r. Very good. Good, Doug. Right. I need to skip through all the x's that happen to already be there. Go back to the first zero I see. Right? And when I do that, I mark that zero with an x. I turn back the other way. <laughs> you go back through the zeros, go back through the other x's, back to the beginning. You're ready to start again. Now the difference here is, now that we're going through, when we get to this point, this might not be a 0, right? This might be a x. So here's what we're going to do. You know, z's, zeros turn into z's, and then they turn back. So x's are going to turn into y's, and then we'll turn them back into x's. That's the way it goes. x turns into a y, go to the right, and then Skip through all the x's. And when you see a 0, head over here and continue skipping through the zeros. So the key thing is that if you're looking at a 0, change that to a z. But if you're looking at an x, change that to a y. But the purposes of those symbols are to keep track of how much we've copied of those n. I know, it's a lot of stuff. I know. But that's just the way you do Turing machines. It's just the way it is. That's why you don't do them too often, or too many. Uh, we're never going to be in that state where we're on an x and heading straight into a 1, so it's OK, because we're going to stop when we get to there and not do that's, that's true. That's true. I think we need to add a couple more transitions on this inner loop. Just make sure we get everything. This is all right. This is all right. This is all. Do you get this feeling like when we're all done, we'd have to debug this thing? Good, because that's just the same as your programs, right? You plan and you plan, you think you're getting everything, you nail it down, you think of all the things that might go wrong, you fix it, you fix it, you fix it, and then two years later there's a memory leak, right? You don't know where it is, and you debug and debug and you finally find it. And it's the same with Turing machines. You can't debug this any more accurately than you can debug your programs. It's a hard job. Uh, this way, what about this arrow? What else might I go through here? The Y's. The Y's. Right. When I finish bringing through a zero to the other side, I turn the zeros to z's, and I turn the x's to y's. 
So on the way back, I might pass through z z's, and I'm going to have to pass through the y's also to get to the next legitimate 0 or x. 0 or x's need to be copied. z's or y's have already been copied. Make that as a comment. So y's get passed through. z's get passed through. Zeros or x's get copied. All right, let's go back to our, so that's it for the inner loop. It's complete. There's nothing wrong with it. Let's go back to this outer loop. This is OK. This is OK. This is OK. What about here in the outer loop? I'm, I'm backing up through the z's and turning them into zeros. But I got to back up through the y's and turn them back into x's. So it looks like this. If there's a y here, turn it into an x and keep going left. And if there's more, then do them all. And then if you hit a dollar sign, continue. So back up through the zeros. After you're done backing up through the zeros, back up through the y's, turn them into x's. This puts zeros back into z's, x's back into y's keeps track of my double counter that I have here. One that's counting how much of this 0 to the n I've pulled over, and one that counts how much, how many times I've done that. That's really why I have two different variables, because I have two different counters. The purpose of this tedious example is to give you a sense of how this kind of feels like a program. There's a double loop here, and there's two indices in this loop. One index in the loop is the z's. The other index in the loop is the y's. When you get back to the initialize the loop, the z's turn back to zeros, the y's turn back to x's. I think we're almost done. Uh, good. Do you want to turn all the x's into y's then as we go across the direction? One by one, we're going to turn them into y's. If you see a zero, you turn it to a z. If you see an x, you turn it to a y, which, whichever one of those happens. And then you walk all the way to the other end and drop a zero. Then go all the way back. And then if you see an x, you turn it to a y. If you see a 0, you turn it to a z. But the ones that are already y's and z's, you've counted those, so you don't want to count them again. When you're all done copying it over, this whole sequence of zeros looks like z's and y's. And when you back up to do it again, to copy it over again, you want to turn them back to zeros and x's so that they look like what you really are counting. Is that, it's, in that corner be x, y? No, no, this is the place where we're looking at an x and we're saying this x hasn't yet been moved over to the other side. The zero that represents this x spot hasn't been moved over to the other side. So we're going to mark it with a y. That says, says that we've, we've moved this guy. And then we want to go through all the other x's before we go back here and mark the next one. Right? We don't want to move too many at once. We're only moving one here. Does that make sense, Tom? You know, if this still isn't clear after we're done in five minutes, it would probably be a worthwhile thing if you're playing with a Turing machine simulator. You could probably put this up on the graphics screen in five minutes and watch it go. And actually, maybe I'll even have Dimitri do that in recitation. It might even be useful to see it. Probably better than just staring at this. All right, let's finish it up. We're almost done. Which one of these states do we actually exit from? It's the hidden one. <laughs> We're backing up through the ones and we'll see if there's an x next. Where is that? Uh, over on the far upper right. Here? Yep. I think when you back through these z's. You won't have any z's. They'll just be y. Be just, just a y. y there. So when you hit y, you yeah. know. Hmm. I guess that's true, but that's not where I did it. <laughs> hmm. Did you make it all the way back to well, no, you couldn't. 
All right, so say it looks like this. Uh, we've just copied everything over, so it looks like uh, y to the n, right? 1 to the n squared, and o to the n squared. And now we are, we are here, backing through the 1s. And at this point, I say you're going to get a z, but I see. But you might not get a z, because it might be a capital Y. Mm -hmm. And if it's a y, it means that you're done. done. Right. 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 So you know what I did? I didn't wait for this. I actually did this on the way forward. Um, way forward the next time? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do it your way. Your way's better. So out of this state, it's too bad, though, because I drew it thinking I'd leave from here. But All right, so we're leaving here. Bye-bye. Dot, dot, dot. Comes out here.